So, in one of my earliest videos, I said, The problem with talking about the Warrior of Light is that the player essentially fills in the role of the Warrior of Light, so any specifics on personality and backstory is really down to the player. Also, there isn't much lore about the Warrior of Light that we aren't outright shown in the game by virtue of, well, being the Warrior of Light, so I thought I'd talk instead about the various different races the player can choose in the game. And while I still think that talking about the Warrior of Light is tricky for all the reasons I mentioned, I do think there's a certain amount of lore we can go over and some ambiguities to clear up about the player character themselves, at least in general. Hello, I'm the Solid Exarch, and today we're going to be talking about the Warrior of Light. To start off, this is going to be part one of a two-part series going over the Warrior of Light. In this one, I'll be talking more about the general lore that canonically applies to all Warriors of Light, and in the second video, I'll be specifically going over the lore of my own Warrior of Light, Mutsuki Yuko. Also, I did want to warn you guys that I will be openly discussing topics from ARR, Heaven's Word, and Stormblood with no spoiler warnings, and I will be saving all of my discussion about the things we learn in Shadowbringers to the end of the video. In general, I typically reserve spoiler warnings only for content revealed to us in the latest patches MSQ, but I feel like Shadowbringers as a whole drops some pretty heavy lore on us in regards to the Warrior of Light, and I really don't want to spoil that for anyone. I know I haven't really mentioned this in a while, but because this is such a basic topic, and because my channel's been growing a lot recently, I figured I'd give a warning for people who might be newer to the game and or my channel and don't want to get accidentally spoiled. With that out of the way, let's begin. Ordinarily, I would start by talking about the history and origins of the Warrior of Light. However, the exact past and backstory of the Warrior of Light is one of those things the game leaves pretty open to interpretation. It's definitely one of those things the game likes to leave for the player to choose themselves. Whether the Warrior of Light is from Eorzea, or from another region, what their childhood was like, and why they became an adventurer is really all up to you. While this definitely leaves things open to interpretation, it also means there really isn't much to say about the Warrior of Light's history. There was one interesting part about the Warrior of Light's backstory I did want to go over, however, mostly because it's one of the few times that the differences between 1.0 and A Realm Reborn have a noticeable impact on the rest of the story. Legacy characters, characters created back in 1.0 and transferred to 2.0 onwards, get special dialogue and changed cutscenes that allude to them having previously joined the Path of the Twelve and their familiarity with the members of the Scions, as well as the city-state leaders. These characters became adventurers before the Calamity, and took part in helping the Circle of Knowing and the Path of the Twelve defend the realm. They're also confirmed to have been the same Warriors of Light that you're told about very early on in the game, the ones who fought for the realm during the Battle of Karnu, and whose faces can't be remembered by most people. In fact, the in-universe explanation for the special tattoo a legacy character gets is that it's the mark of having been touched by the magics of the Twelve during Luiswa's spell that sent them five years into the future. This is in contrast to any characters created after 2.0. These characters' pasts are a bit more ambiguous. While they don't get the same cutscenes that the 1.0 legacy characters do, the game never explicitly states that they aren't the same Warriors of Light who fought in the Battle of Karnu. You could say that, technically speaking, the lack of the legacy tattoo means they weren't sent five years into the future by Luis was spell, meaning they weren't the same Warriors of Light, but considering obtaining the tattoo and the legacy status hasn't been possible for a majority of the game's lifespan, and considering the story still alludes to the Warriors of Light at the Battle of Kartnu and compares you to them constantly, I'm going to call this one a toss-up. If you want to say your Warrior of Light was there at the Battle of Kartnu, go for it. Outside of this, however, there really isn't much to go over about the Warrior of Light's backstory or history. I also really don't want to go over the Warrior of Light's story in the context of the game, as that's literally the main focus of the game. I might make videos later summarizing the game's story, probably broken down by expansion, but I think that would be a little bit beyond the scope of a single video. So instead, I'm going to go over some basic things that are true about all Warriors of Light. To start off, all Warriors of Light have been blessed by Hydaelyn and possess both the Blessing of Light and the Echo. I've already gone into details regarding both of these abilities in a previous video, but we have learned a bit of information about the Echo since, so I'll summarize that here. The Echo is a powerful, multifaceted ability that's best known for granting the Warrior of Light immunity to the process of tempering and allowing them to see into the pasts of other people. The Warrior of Light seems to have very little control over the second ability, with their visions into the past often coming on suddenly and abruptly, and causing them visible pain or discomfort. These visions often reveal relevant information to whatever the Scions are helping out with or investigating at the time, so it's possible that the Warrior of Light does have some subconscious control over the Echo. Or perhaps Hydaelyn is controlling it for us to reveal important facts and help guide us on our journey. 
Either way, these aren't the only two powers the Echo possesses. One of the Echo's stated powers is that it allows one to see into the hearts of others. This explains why the Warrior of Light can see into people's pasts, but it also allows them to implicitly understand any spoken language, like that of the Asians. The Echo also allows the Warrior of Light to envision encounters multiple times and relive them, which explains both how you as a player can queue up for the same fight multiple times, and why dying and failing an important story-based fight doesn't instantly end the Warrior of Light story right there. This particular application seems to be susceptible to things that manipulate your memories, such as embellishments made by the Wandering Minstrel, explaining extreme trials and savage and ultimate raids in the context of the story. They're the Warrior of Light re-envisioning the fight with differences brought on by changes and flaws in their memory. The other power the Warrior of Light possesses is the Blessing of Light. The Blessing of Light, sometimes also called Hydaelyn's Blessing, is a blessing bestowed upon the Warrior of Light by Hydaelyn herself. It provides the Warrior of Light with extra strength and Hydaelyn's protection. When she has the power for it, at least. I should note that the Warrior of Light's immense strength doesn't come solely from Hydaelyn's blessing, as shown when Midgard Somer strips the blessing of light from them post Aurum Reborn specifically to test their strength without being chosen by Hydaelyn. The Warrior of Light is still able to go on and continue fighting primals and protecting the realm, meaning that, while the blessing of light certainly is responsible for some of their strength, they are strong on their own without it. In addition to the blessing of light and the echo, the Warrior of Light is shown to be very quick to pick up on things and is able to quickly match or surpass even their own mentors in whatever areas they pursue. How many skills the Warrior of Light possesses is another one of those things that's entirely up to the player, whether you stick to one job on your character or get everything to max level, but the dialogue in the context of even a single job definitely implies that the Warrior of Light is exceptionally talented and is able to learn new skills incredibly quickly. The Warrior of Light's combat abilities are also quite notable, with them being able to read their opponents and avoid many attacks. They also overwhelm their foes with incredible force, with multiple foes commenting on their impossible strength and power, as well as their tenacity. The Warrior of Light is shown taking on waves of trained soldiers and fighters at a time and coming out on top, and holding their own against powerful foes and allies alike. They're also easily the strongest member of the Scions, which might not seem like a big deal at first, but keep in mind the Scions were considered some of the best defenders of the realm before they had the Warrior of Light on their side. Now, granted, most of this was due to their intimate knowledge of primals and their tireless work trying to mediate between the city-states and the beast tribes, but their strength and combat prowess is definitely noticeable. Thankrid is implied to be on par with the trained Domen Shinobi when Yugiri comments on his skills. Yustola is a master of etherology and is one of the only known students of Matoya, who was said to be rivals on par with Louis Swa, who was easily one of Charlene's strongest mages. Papalimo is able to cast a smaller version of the spell that Louis Swa used to invoke the power of the Twelve at the Battle of Cardinu. And finally, when Lys encounters Ferdola during the Garlean ambush of Raugr's Reach, Ferdola felt it necessary to specifically warn Xenos about her combat abilities. And in spite of all of this, the Warrior of Light is still the strongest by a good margin. Of course, the Warrior of Light is more than just their strength and abilities. They also have a strong personality and character that, alongside their talents, cements them as a hero worthy of the title. Like most things regarding the Warrior of Light, the game does like to leave a lot of the Warrior of Light's personality up to the interpretation of the player, but the game does give us enough to go off of to make some comments about the core fundamentals of their personality. First off, the Warrior of Light is shown to be incredibly kind and helpful, constantly going out of their way to help others in need, even if it may seem trivial or unwarranted for an adventurer of their caliber and fame to deal with. The game does drop some hints that the Warrior of Light sometimes feels like their generosity is exploited, and they feel a little bit bitter about being taken for granted, but whether this is the case or not, they still ultimately wind up helping out. In addition, the Warrior of Light does value the lives of their friends and those around them in general. The Warrior of Light seems rather distraught when someone winds up dying, whether it be a friend or an enemy. Of course, they're also willing to fight and do what needs to be done when the fate of the realm is at stake, even if it means fighting and even killing. Though. That last part is also open to interpretation, very debatable, and is probably a discussion video for another day. All of this adds up to make the Warrior of Light one of the strongest characters in Final Fantasy XIV. They're a powerful ally and asset to those who defend the realm, and a dangerous foe for anyone who would threaten it. And that's pretty much all I can say without talking about the stuff we learn in Shadowburners. Once again, it's been a while since I've given this kind of spoiler warning, but we are covering a really basic topic, so I felt it was appropriate. With that being said, I do have some important announcements I wanted to make at the end of the video, so go ahead and skip to the time on screen if you want to avoid spoilers. Okay, so 
I know I said earlier that we don't know anything about the Warrior of Light's backstory because the devs wanted to leave that up to the players, and while that is true for the most part, Shadowbringer's story does dive into the Warrior of Light's past in a way that doesn't interfere with that goal. See, the end of Shadowbringers reveals the Warrior of Light was a sundered ancient Asian, and later in 5.3 it's revealed who this Asian was, a Zem, a member of Amarat's government, the Convocation of Fourteen. Because the Warrior of Light is a fragment of Azem's soul, this technically means that Azem's backstory is also the Warrior of Light's backstory. So I did think it fitting to talk about that here. As mentioned, Azem was a member of the Convocation, however they seem to be a bit of the odd one out, and outward described as a divisive figure in the political landscape of Amaranth. They seemed to have been a bit of a wanderer compared to the rest of the Convocation, and while much of the rest of Amarat had a very pragmatic, hands-off approach to the other settlements and civilizations, it definitely seems like Azem was always going out of their way to help others, well before this would become one of the defining characteristics of the Warrior of Light. Azem also seemed to have had a blatant disregard for the rules of the Convocation, with a conversation between Emmet Selk and Elidibus revealing that their conduct has, in the past, gotten them censured. Azem was one of the most adamant voices against the summoning of Zodiark to try to stave off the final days, and left the convocation before they summoned him. They also rejected the proposal from another group, led by Vinat, to summon Hydaelyn in response to Zodiark's summoning. What this says about the relationship between Azem, Vinat, Hydaelyn, and the Warrior of Light is unknown, but something tells me that we'll get some information about it in the future. After Hydaelyn defeated Zodiark and split the world into the Source and the Thirteen Shards, Azem was one of the many souls that were sundered with them and was split across the Source and the Thirteen Reflections. The part of their soul still residing on the Source is the soul that ultimately becomes our Warrior of Light. This brings me to one more notable thing about the Warrior of Light, and Sundered Asians in general. Because those living on the Source at the time of the Great Sundering were splintered across the Reflections just like the world itself, every time the Asians trigger a rejoining, the Shard that was destroyed and all associated Aether in that Shard, well, rejoins with the Source. Presumably, this also includes all the Sundered Souls, which is reinforced by the fact that the Cyan Souls were said to be much denser than the souls of those from the first. This means that, at the start of the story, the Warrior of Light, or their soul at least, has been through a rejoining seven times, and is therefore eight fourteenths of Azem's original soul. And by the time the end of Shadowbringers rolls around, they fuse with Ardbert and that number bumps up to nine fourteenths. The thing with Ardbert also possibly means that the Warrior of Light can fuse with any soul that used to be part of his M. However, the conditions to allow this to happen aren't exactly clear. For starters, it's very likely that one of the two individuals has to be dead or otherwise not occupying a body. When Ardbert fused with the Warrior of Light, he had been dead and free of a body for a century at that point, and earlier when the two encountered each other in the Source, there wasn't any weird light or reaction. It's also possible that both parties have to be willing, because when it happens, Ardbert willingly gives himself up to strengthen the Warrior of Light. Though, to be fair, both of these are pure speculation, and I doubt we'll be getting many more examples of this moving forward, at least for the time being. Anyway, this combined with Azem's presumed experience as both a warrior and adventurer, possibly explains at least some of the Warrior of Light's strength and abilities. While the personality, backstory, and details of the Warrior Light are down to the player who controls them, the very soul of the character is a selfless adventurer who lends aid to all who need it, and fights and defends for what they want to protect. And I think that's all there is to say about the Warrior of Light in general. Any specifics seem to be up to the player to decide, which I think is one of the main draws and appeal of an MMO like Final Fantasy XIV. In fact, in my next video, I'm going to do something a little bit different and give you guys an introduction on my Warrior of Light, Mutsuki Yuko. This also doubles as a VTuber introduction and my 1000 subscriber special, so it's going to be a pretty big video for me, and I hope you all enjoy it. Earlier, I did say I had some announcements and things I wanted to mention at the end of the video, so I'll get to those now. The first one is that, like I just said, I just hit 1000 subscribers. I want to thank you all for the incredible support and tell you how grateful I am to all of you who have subscribed. I've been getting a lot of amazing feedback and you guys really seem to enjoy my videos, and I really love making them so I do hope you stick with me as I continue to improve and grow my channel. The second thing is that my real life schedule has just become a lot more open and flexible, so I should be able to increase the rate of my video production. In fact, I've actually decided to start up a second channel. It's an ASMR channel where I'm hoping to get a bit more creative and explore both derivative and original fantasy, modern, and maybe even sci-fi storytelling slash roleplays. 
I've always been into creative writing and I enjoy ASMR as a sleep aid, so it's something I wanted to do for a while. I know ASMR isn't really for everyone, but if you enjoy it, feel free to check it out. The channel name is Sleep Exarch Roleplays right here on YouTube, and the link is in the description. My final announcement isn't really anything new, but it's a reminder that I do stream over on Twitch. I've been having a lot of fun streaming lately, and I really do enjoy it, so I would really appreciate it if you guys could check me out and help me grow on Twitch as well. I do play Final Fantasy XIV, but I've also been branching out into other games, and I also do art streams on there sometimes, so be sure to check me out. It's over on twitch.tv slash saltxarc, and once again the link is in the description. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, do be sure to leave me a like, drop any suggestions, questions, or comments down below, and subscribe if you want more Final Fantasy XIV lore content from me. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace out.